Okay, we're going to start off with a special little video presentation, so let's start with that first. Polar regions have fascinated brave explorers for over a century. While expeditions around the world charted paths to unknown lands, only the bravest would dare explore the world's most remote and dangerous areas. Many lives were lost trying to unlock the secrets of the Earth's poles. And with every discovery, there were as many failures. Today, equipped with state-of-the-art technology, modern explorers are looking to expand on the discoveries of the past. With climate change melting ice shelves at an alarming rate, previously inaccessible areas of both the Arctic and the Antarctic are opening up for the very first time. We find ourselves at the threshold of a very important time, able to explore Earth's last frontiers and making new discoveries which may very well affect the course of all life on our planet. Polar Explorer. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's one movie I really want to see. <laughs> Um, I am a polar explorer and I am a documentary filmmaker and the trailer that you just saw um, is for obviously my new movie called The Polar Explorer. Now in it we are going to be reporting on the new scientific discoveries made both in the Arctic and the Antarctic and that makes this film the world's very first bipolar documentary. Now you might be asking yourself, um, why the polar regions? Wouldn't it be a lot more fun to make documentaries in the Caribbean? And, uh, and you're not wrong. <laughs> but um, I believe the polar regions um, are the bellwether for climate change um, throughout the world. What happens in the polar regions is going to directly impact on all of us. And it's mainly because of the melting land ice that's uh, affecting Antarctica and also uh, Greenland up in the Arctic. So. For this new film, I went on a, a three-week expedition crossing the Northwest Passage, and I just got back from that just a few weeks ago, and I'd like to share some of the, uh, the discoveries that we made along the way. Okay, first of all, this is the ship. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to go back. Okay, this is the ship that we were on. It's a Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker. It's called the Amundsen. And um, Amundsen um, was a famous Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen, as you may know. And he was the first man at the South Pole. And he was also the first man to reach the South Pole and the North Pole in one wooden ship. So this is a very rickety old ship, and, and it's the only one to actually make it to both poles. Now, we're talking 100 years ago. He didn't have a lot of sophisticated equipment, and we had a lot more ice 100 years ago, too. So it was very impressive that he accomplished this, uh, this particular feat, and that's why this ship was named after him. Uh, I just wonder what he would think if he was on this particular vessel these days, eh? So obviously going through the Northwest Passage on a ship like this was relatively uh, easy, mainly because a lot of the ice is now missing. Uh, since the year 2000, 46% of the Arctic ice has melted. Now, you can't really notice that from the satellite photos because the ice coverage is still there. Where it's missing is from underneath. So where an area where they had 10 feet thick of ice is now only 2 feet. And all that means is that the uh, remaining ice is going to melt even faster. So now I'm going to show you exactly the route that we took. Okay. Now I got a nifty little pointy here I'm going to use. Look at that. I love it. Okay, now um, we started over here. This is, this is the route that most people take when they cross the Northwest Passage today. This little spot here is a tiny little community called Saks Harbor with a population of 25. 
And so we started there, we got on, we got on our ship, the Amundsen, and um, what we didn't do is this route. This goes above Banks Island and across the open waters here, the Northwest Passage around Baffin Island and down around into Frobisher Bay. That's what everybody else does. Now a true explorer never does what everybody else does. They like to go to where no one has been before. So what we did is this route. We started again at Saks Harbor, but instead of going up and over Banks Island, we actually went underneath and through a narrow strait called the Prince of Wales Strait. Now, um, it separates uh, Banks Island from Victoria Island. Victoria Island, by the way, is the largest island in Canada. It doesn't get a lot of press because of where it is. But uh, we went through this narrow strait, which is usually frozen solid all the time, which is why passage through it is, is very rare. So we went through that, and then we went across, and we didn't stop there. The next thing we did was when we got to around here, we went straight north, and we went to the tip of Ellesmere Island. This is where North America ends and the ice begins. And we went there for a very particular reason, and I'll explain that to you a little later on. Okay? There we go now. We made uh, quite a few uh, scientific discoveries on this three-week expedition that we're all quite excited about. And this is the first one. This is the very first what in the world uh, picture you're going to be looking at. These are little round ice balls. They're perfectly round. They're in between the size of a mothball and a golf ball. And what's unusual about these particular formations is that they do not bond together like ice usually does. When ice touches these each each other on a, a cold surface of water with, with uh, freezing temperatures in the air, they tend to form um, a nice shell. This wasn't happening with these um, strange little ice balls. They were behaving very unusually. And they were also, um, we found them in, in two very distinct and unusual patterns. Here in this picture, you'll see that they're stretched out in strips. And um, that would suggest that there's a certain wind pattern spreading them out over. But right next to these, they were in perfect circles, like a little pond. And again, they were all together, bouncing off each other, looking like styrofoam chips that somebody spilled from a FedEx box. And um, it was actually my sound guy who was looking out the window with a bridge and casually remarked, oh, what's this stuff? So on all the ice specialists on, on board, all the various scientists, all the crew of the Coast Guard, everybody that has had a lot of exposure to ice had never seen this before. And again, it's because we were traveling on that unusual strait where man has not been before. And um, in fact, it was so um, rare that we actually stopped the ship and went back to take some samples. Now, that's no mean feat because um, it's very, very expensive to uh, haul fuel in a ship that big through the Arctic. So that shows you how important that particular uh, discovery was. Here's another what in the world. What in the world is that? Um, these are mysterious rings that our sonar picked up at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean. This is about 500 meters deep, approximately 1,500 feet down. And um, each of these rings has a diameter of 200 meters and a height of 30 meters. So get your head around that and what that really means. Eh? These are absolutely enormous rings that are all more or less the same size. And they all kind of congregated together, about 24 of them, in one little area. And um, so we called the geologist on board and said, well, what do you think of this? What, what is this? And the geologist looked at that and said, it, it, we, we don't have an explanation for it. Because the usual explanations are like meteors, volcanoes, that sort of thing. But because the, um, the shape and the patterns and the size and the dimensions were so similar, they had to rule out something as random as that. So at a loss, for an explanation, we sent this picture to all the other geologists around the world in Oslo, in Tokyo, in Cambridge, in Harvard, and Yale. And we asked them for their expert opinion. All came back the same. They could not explain these things geologically. Um, so of course, now we're um, investigating this a lot further. And hopefully by the time my film comes out, we'll have an answer. Now, uh, another very, very exciting discovery we made and you might have heard about this yourself, is the Peterman Ice Island. You're looking at the very first picture that um, has ever been taken of this ice island close up. There have been some satellite photos, of course, but this is the very first one um, where we're actually close enough to actually make a landing on this island. Now, the 
Peterman Ice Island is actually a big chunk of freshwater ice that broke off of the Peterman Glacier in Greenland on August 25th. It has floated into Canadian waters, and when it broke off, uh, it was measured at, at a size that's 10 times the size of Manhattan. So again, it, it's hard to imagine the, the absolute size of this thing. And um, we were able to fly over it, actually land a helicopter on it. We have the very first HD film footage ever taken of the world's biggest iceberg. And we planted an ice motion beacon so we can monitor its movement and, uh, and melting capacity. So that was, uh, that was quite a, a stunning achievement, I thought. Now, one of the other amazing things about going to the polar regions is not just the, the scientific uh, part of it, is, is also the beauty of it. There's an awful lot of um, spectacular images and, and scenes and, and sights that you can only get in the, in the polar regions. I, I like to describe it as the closest thing to visiting another planet without leaving Earth. And, and this is one of the first shots we had. Remember I mentioned Saks Harbor where we uh, got on the ship? Um, at the airport there, and I use airport with air quotes, um, we, uh, we actually spotted um, these Arctic fox. Now, if you look really closely, you see they're very well camouflaged, so you have to kind of squint to actually see them. This is uh, apparently a, a very rare sight up there. Arctic fox like to stay away from humans. They like to hide from us. They, they don't really trust us too well. And to see two of them together is even more rare. And, uh, and the reason for this, of course, is because uh, they're getting quite hungry these days, and they're entering uh, areas where man lives, uh, looking for some of his leftover food. So. And here's another beautiful shot. Um, the sunrise there only goes above the horizon at this time of year, and the sun circles around on an ellipse. So it's not up and over like it is here. It's just kind of over the horizon. And when it does that, it casts these beautiful hues of orange and pink. And this particular picture um, reminded me of, a, of an ocean of cotton candy. And here's another amazing uh, iceberg. Now, we found very, very few icebergs in the Arctic, as opposed to the Antarctic. When I'm there, icebergs are everywhere. But here, you know, there are very few of them. So we captured this one. And this one, to me, looks like, you know, three guys sitting on a couch with their coffee table in front of them, right? And you can tell the, the oldest iceberg is the one in the middle uh, because it has all the wrinkles on it. Right? <laughs> now, here's a, another interesting chunk of ice. Now, if, if you look beyond the, uh, the actual iceberg, you'll notice that there's no other icebergs in sight, eh? So this was a real standalone. And we found this very close to the Peterman Ice Island. And uh, we believe it's a fragment of the, of the island. You see on the, on the side there where it's all jagged, that's where it would have broken off. Now here's another um, interesting sunrise picture. This is uh, 12 o'clock noon. This is high noon in the Arctic. Uh, you know, here in Toronto, when you say it's, um, it's high noon, the sun is right over your head. But in the Arctic, it's kind of at eye level. So I thought that was an interesting shot. Now this is, um, this is a particular iceberg that's classified as tabular. And tabular is just a, a fancy adjective for the word table, because it looks like a tabletop. Um, hard to imagine from this picture, we don't have any size relation to go with it, but I'll tell you that's about 500 meters high. It's as high as a 15-story office building. So big chunks of ice. Okay, now right here, what you're looking at is something very interesting. This is a good story. Uh, that's me in the middle, of course, and my cameraman, Demir Chetil, on my left, and my sound guy, Steve McNamee, on my right. And what we're wearing are called survival suits. And that's because we were dropped on the fragile ice. You see the ship parked behind us actually just crashed through this ice to drop us there. So the ice is very fragile. We could go through it at any time. And that's why we have these suits on. And I was greatly relieved to hear that the Coast Guard said, wearing these suits and falling in, in the Arctic water will give you an extra two minutes to live. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> So they put us on this, uh, on this ice because we wanted to um, plant an ice motion beacon on this particular chunk of ice. And so we noticed up ahead there was a ridge, and the higher that you can plant this, the better. And um, so we were heading towards that ridge, which is about, I don't know, 200 meters away from the ship. And just as we put our foot on the edge of the, the ridge, a loudspeaker came over the ship, and it said, Stop. Do not go any further. 
polar bears on the other side of the ridge waiting for you. <laughs> Return to the ship immediately. And we did. You should see us run. And luckily, we left our cameras running, too, so it's good footage of that. And then, um, then they blew a foghorn. Now, these, these are very hungry bears, you have to remember, because you know, they, they use the ice as a platform to hunt with. And they look over and they catch a seal. And, and then without that kind of ice coverage anymore, these guys are very hungry. So um, uh, we were looking like a buffet to them. Um, but when they blew the foghorn, it actually scared them away. Uh, and this, is, this goes against all the other things you usually hear about um, bears where you just lie calm and do nothing, play dead. Don't do that with polar bears. You'll get eaten. Okay. So ag again, um, the reason we're doing this is because um, what's happening in the polar regions is of great concern to the world. Um, as the land ice melts there, it's going to cause flooding and tsunamis, and, uh, and we want to avoid that. So I'm heading to Cancun in December uh, at the invitation of the United Nations to, uh, to share these uh, discoveries with the world leaders, and I'm very proud to be a, a spokesman of the, um, of the polar regions in this regard. And I'm going to um, leave you with one little telling video as to what could happen if um, the polar regions get very warm. There's no denying the effects of global warming on our planet. Countries around the world have been experiencing record temperatures for years, but none more pronounced than right here in Antarctica. I'm standing in beautiful Neko Harbor here, where the temperatures have increased hugely in the past five years. Um, five years ago, the idea of swimming in Antarctica was not only ludicrous, but actually impossible, because most of the shoreline water is now frozen. However, as you can see over my shoulder, the water is not frozen. And the temperature today is a balmy 8 degrees Celsius. And to me, that sounds like a good temperature for a swim. One day we may all be swimming with the penguins. Thank you very much. <laughs>